glad. I'm glad that I'm saved. I'm glad that no matter what goes on in this world, when it's all over, I'm going to heaven. Aren't you glad? Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Now we've got got some changes going on. In case you don't know, we've got Brother Du is uh, he's he has to stay in Chunju uh, with his wife because she needs um, constant care right now. Uh, so he's not here. Uh, Allie and Kenny. Uh, Allie's gone. She you won't see her again at least not until she comes back. And so they were doing our youth program. So now uh, Brother Kerry and his wife are doing the youth program. So. Uh, you saw all that motion heading out. That's what's going on there. Think nothing more of it. And so we are in Matthew chapter 16, and uh, we're going to read verses uh, 13 through 16. Ultimately, we're going to look at verses 13 through 28. But this morning, verses 13 through 16, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to read along with me. And then uh, after we read, I'll pray, and then we'll be seated. Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, He asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Let's pray. Lord, we know you as the Christ. We know you as the Son of the living God. And as we read this passage... Lord, it excites our hearts that the disciples are coming to a fuller understanding of who you are. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for saving us. And Lord, as we read passages like this, and especially later in the chapter, and we see Peter and the knowledge that you gave him and then the blunders that he was able to make, we're, we're encouraged, Lord. We're an imperfect people, and yet you love us anyway. So help us to glean from this message, and we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your bulletin, you can see off on the right-hand side, on the inside of the bulletin, I usually put a very quick outline there for folks. The title of the message is Peter's Confession and Peter's Digression. It's interesting. There are numerous events in the life of Christ that we call great events, and we've been working our way through those heading into the Easter season. But this one falls directly on the heels of our last sermon. Usually there's a little space in between, but this one falls directly on the heels. If you remember the discussion that they had and that we were uh, looking at last week about the leaven of the Pharisees. And so uh, that's where the, you know, that's where the passage meets us in time. So they're now in an area that's called Caesarea Philippi, Caesarea Philippi, which is, it's a very Gentile area Uh, It's about 27 miles north of where they previously were. The interesting thing is, I was looking at this on a map, but the walk is is pretty much all uphill. 27 miles, gaining in elevation. You know, when these guys decided to follow Jesus, they didn't jump into their cars. (laughs) They walked 27 miles uphill to follow Jesus. What would you do to follow Jesus, right? That one was free. Now we're going to get back to the regular message. Up to this point... In Christ's ministry, what has happened? He has overcome Satan in the wilderness. He has healed the sick, diseased, the demon-possessed. He's fed the multitudes in the wilderness. He's controlled the weather, forgiven sins. He's done so many things. He frustrated the daylights out of the religious leaders of his day. He's called his disciples to him which have now been by his side for over a year his ministry is flourishing then on top of all of this his fame has spread abroad so much so that many people are now flocking to hear his message and when they come to hear him it is so overwhelming to jesus and the disciples that they find it even difficult to find time to even be alone And this is where we are. This is the backdrop of the message today. And though we're looking at the great events in the life of Christ, we cannot miss the contrast that comes in this passage. Now, the great event is the confession of Peter. But you can't really look at that without seeing what happens almost immediately next. Peter makes a great confession, and then Jesus teaches him a great lesson, gives him some wonderful promises. Then after that, 
Peter makes a great digression. So if you have your outline there in front of you, you can see that we're going to look at four different points. A great confession, verses 13 through 16. A great promise, verses 17 through 20. A great mistake, verses 21 and 22. And then lastly, in verse 23, a great rebuke. So that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. And uh, Brother O, can you bring me some hot water? It's, it, I can feel it in the back of my throat. <clears throat> I need some help. <clears throat> last week, I, I, I'll tell you the honest truth. Last week, it was like 15 minutes before the end of the message, and I, I didn't know if I was going to finish. But the Lord gives grace, and I thank it for it. A great confession, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16. We read that earlier. I'm going to read it again. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So first Jesus asked them, Who do other people say that I am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some say Elias, and others Jeremiah, and one of the, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus poses two questions to his disciples. And the first was simple. It's a very simple question. Easy to answer. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? In other words, what do other people say? To answer this question, it doesn't require, you know, digging into what you personally think. All you have to do is report what everybody else is saying. That's all they have to do at this point. The thing is, Jesus knows the hearts of all men. He knew what other people thought about him. He knew what other people were saying. He's not asking them the question because he wants to know something. He already knows. He's asking the question to lead them somewhere. It was time to take the disciples to the next level, if you will. To upgrade, if you will. He wants to teach them more about who he is. Later in Matthew 16 and verse 21, it says, From that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So he's ready to begin revealing a lot more about his ministry. But they're not really ready to receive it just yet. There was so much more to teach them. And he needed to get them into the right frame of mind first. I don't know if you noticed, but the answer to the first question was very positive. Everything's positive. Nobody said, well, Lord, there's some people out there that think that you're a scoundrel. That was true. Some people did. But they didn't bring that up. Some people out there think that you're, you know, you're a false prophet, which some people did, but they didn't bring that up. Their answer is very, very positive. And if you read through the Gospels, you're going to notice that their answer was not really complete. They didn't really tell the bad news. They only told the, you know, the good stuff, the good part. And so they're telling Jesus only those things that are, you know, good, complimentary. But that's not what Jesus was asking. He wanted to know what the general perception was concerning the Son of Man. And the thing is, most of the people had a pretty high opinion of Jesus. That's why multitudes followed him, because most people at this point like him. They believe that he's special. They believe he's a great teacher, a rabbi. But they're not ready to receive him as Messiah, at least not yet. So they answer, well, Lord, some people think you're John the Baptist. Well, that's what Herod thought, if you remember. Herod, when Herod heard about Jesus, he said, oh, no, it's John the Baptist risen from the dead. Because he had John the Baptist killed. And now he's afraid that he's back. But Jesus was not John the Baptist. Others said that he was Elijah. And with good reason, because the Old Testament actually prophesied that Elijah would come. So some people thought that he was Elijah. Some thought he was Jeremiah. In fact, a number of Jewish writers believed that Jeremiah was the fulfillment of Moses' statement. Now, you remember Moses. Moses talked about that witness, a great prophet that would come in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. And it said this, it said, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. And so a lot of the Jewish writers of that day, the Jewish rabbis of that day, thought Jeremiah was the fulfillment of that prophecy. 
But Jeremiah wasn't that prophet that Moses spoke of. In fact, Jesus wasn't Jeremiah at all. I mean, that would require a reincarnation. I mean, think about it. God doesn't do reincarnation. Now, he does transformation. He does salvation. But he doesn't do reincarnation. And there are some people that believe that, you know. The Buddhists, they have this, this idea that if you, if you die in this life, if you were good, maybe you'll come back as a higher form of life. Or maybe you'll become one with the universe, nirvana or whatever, you know. I don't know that I'd necessarily like to be one with the universe. I know too much about it. There's a lot of messed up people in this universe. Not so sure I want to be one with them. Or if you are bad, maybe you come back as, I don't know, a chicken or, you know, a, a worm or something. That's what they think. They believe in reincarnation. They believe that most people come back as another person. I mean, you were neither good nor bad. You tried to work your way through, but you didn't quite get it. So you come back as another person, and you get to try again and again and again and again until you finally get it right. Um, that's not the Bible. Nowhere. You can't find one hint of reincarnation anywhere in the Scriptures. Jesus was not the reincarnation of John the Baptist, nor was he the reincarnation of Isaiah, nor was he the reincarnation of Jeremiah. Others had their various opinions. You know, he's some sort of prophet, some sort of teacher. But the interesting thing is that all of their opinions requires some sort of reincarnation or at least a resurrection. But then Jesus gets personal. He says, okay, now, guys, you know what everybody else is saying. You know what their opinion is. You know that they all think that I'm somebody special. But who do you think I am? That same question is posed to every living human being. Who do you think that Jesus is? Whom say ye that I am? It's one thing to say what others think about Jesus. It's one thing to repeat what you heard your pastor say. Or what your teacher said or your mom and dad said. It's one thing to say what other people told you. But when you make it personal, what's your answer now? Jesus still demands that every one of us answer that very same, very personal question. Who is Jesus to you? Well, my, my mom says that he's the Savior of the world. And I know that that's the right answer. Okay, that's great that your mom said that. It's great that your mom taught you that. I think more mothers ought to do that. But who do you say Jesus is? Who is he to you personally? The truth is... Nowadays, public opinion varies a lot on Jesus, even today. Who is he to you? Is he a religious leader? Is he a, a great prophet? Or is he your Lord and Savior? Who is he to you? Nowadays, there's a lot of people who say a lot of things about Jesus, and most of it usually is good. Now, I know you got those out there that like to badmouth you know, Jesus, the, the fringe, you know, the, the atheist or the God-haters. And, and, you know, I, I know that there are those out there. But most people, if you ask them, who is Jesus? They'll give you an answer that is usually complimentary, but usually far short of who Jesus really is. Who is he? That's the same problem we see today. Most people admit Jesus lived and he was a great man and a great religious leader, but very few will actually answer and say, He is my Lord and Savior. I gave my heart to Him. I gave my life to Him. He saved me from my sins. Very few people would actually answer that way. In fact, if you were to ask a group of unbelievers, you might get a variety of answers. But folks, there's only one right answer. Only one. And that's where Peter makes his great confession. Look at verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Was Jesus a local teacher from Nazareth? Sure, sure he was. But he was a lot more. Was Jesus a prophet? Yeah, yeah, of course he was. But he was so much more. Peter's profession, his confession puts it all into context for us. Helps us see a bigger picture. Jesus was not just a teacher. Not just a good man. Not just a prophet. He is the Christ. The anointed of God. That's who he was. But even more than that, he calls him 
the son of the living God. Now that's a, that's a powerful statement. For a Jew to say something like that, what were they saying? To the Jew, to be the son of anyone meant that you carried the characteristics of that person. So, you know, you've got, you know, somebody whose name is like Joseph uh, bin Isaiah or whatever. It means Joseph, the son of Isaiah. And they do that because they expected Joseph to carry the same characteristic, morally speaking, and even, you know, in his personality as his father. That's the way they did it in those days. If you were a Jew in the first century and your father was a carpenter, you would be a carpenter. If he, if he was a shepherd, you would be a shepherd. You would be born into that and you would become what your father was. And that's what the Jews' mindset was. So when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, what was he saying? You, re you might remember the discourse of John chapter 10. And if you turn there, John chapter 10, where Jesus stated that God was his Father. Thank you, sir. That's all I wanted. What I need. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 33. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. I love that. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I, now get this, verse 30, very important statement. I and my Father are one. What happens next? Look at verse 31. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Again. Meaning this is not the first time. To stone him. Jesus answered them. Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. So when Jesus said that God was his personal father, they understood what that meant. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he wasn't saying, you know, I agree with my Father. He wasn't saying, my Father and I kind of hang out together and we like all the same things. He wasn't saying that. He was saying literally, I and my Father are one. One being. We call it the, the, the Trinity. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit is God. There is one God. Wrap your mind around that if you can understand it clearly. See me after the service. I don't understand it clearly, but I do know what the Bible teaches. And I believe the Bible. And they were going to stone him for, for saying that. So you've got to wrap, wrap your mind around this. When Peter called Jesus the Son of God, he was basically calling him God. He was saying that Jesus, you are deity. That's what he was saying. Not a deity. Not one among many. Because the Jews only believed in one God. And that's the point to which Jesus needs to bring them. He needs his disciples to grasp this great truth. They needed to see him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when Peter says that, then Jesus makes a great promise. Notice this, verses 17 through 20. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, in Jesus' response, we, we learn some things, some very important things about just how much our salvation or any spiritual truth is a work of God and not our own. Peter did not come to this conclusion because somebody told him. He did not come to this conclusion because he read an article on the internet. 
He came to this conclusion because, as Jesus said, it was given to him by his Father. God illuminated Peter's mind, and Peter understood who Jesus was. He was blessed because God, through his Spirit, revealed the truth to him. It is the Spirit of God that gives spiritual understanding. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Do you know you can read your Bible as a lost person? And unless the Holy Spirit gives you something, you're not going to get any spiritual lessons. You might read, you know, and understand this king's name and what he did. And, you know, you might, you might read Genesis chapter 1 and be able to figure out on day 1 this happened and day 2 that happened and so forth and so on. But when it comes to deep, spiritual understanding God does that for you you can't come to it on your own so it's at this point where Jesus now gives Peter a new name and boy what a big discussion on that he's no longer Simon which by the way Simon was a very common name at that time he calls him Peter the name Peter means rock that's what it means it means stone the Greek word describes a stone that is small enough that you can carry it in your hand or your pocket, okay? It's not a boulder, but a stone. But when Jesus said, and upon this rock I will build my church, he uses a different word. This is a word that refers to a bedrock, a huge rock, a foundation stone, a massive stone that you can build something on. That's the idea there. If you've read this before and you thought or maybe somebody told you that Peter was the rock upon which Jesus built the church, I'm sorry. The church is not built upon a man. The church is built upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He is that rock. Some people say, no, that's not what he meant. What he meant was the truth that was expressed. All right, six and one, half dozen of the other. I'm not going to split hairs with you, but the fact is it certainly wasn't Peter. Not at all. Upon this rock, I will build my church. The church is built upon the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I like what Jesus says concerning the church. It's not some weak and beggarly existence. It's a powerful force, so powerful that even the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Sometimes we get this idea as a church that we're some kind of weak little entity and the world is picking on us and how are we going to survive? Well, you're not, if you think that way. But we've been empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. We're, the, we're, the, we're built upon a solid foundation the Lord Jesus Christ. He said He would build His church. He said the gates of hell would not prevail against us. So what in the world are we whining and being little cowardly people about? We don't need to be that way. Right. We're a powerful force in the world, and we need to be reaching all the way to the gates of hell and snatching people out. Mm -hmm. That's what we can do yes, if we'll do it. Then he goes on, and Peter receives the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. What are those? A lot of discussion has gone into exactly what the keys of the kingdom mean. Was it just for Peter? Or was it for the church? Is it something that's still in effect today? You know, we can discuss these things until we're blue in the face and we can all have an opinion. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, study it out, come to your own opinion. I don't care which one you hold. It's not important to me. I do know this, that Peter was the first one to give the gospel to the Jews, in Acts chapter 2. He was the first one to give the gospel to the Gentiles, Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. He was also the first one uh, after, you know, after Pentecost to preach and you know, 3,000 people get saved and he preaches again later and 5,000 people. So, I, I, I don't know, but I kind of think that has something to do with it, right? That's just me. But do you know what's absolutely amazing? With all of this deep truth that has been expressed, what does Jesus then command them to do? Look at verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. And you read that and you say, what? Wait a minute now. I thought we supposed to tell everybody about Jesus. We supposed to spread this out to the whole world. Well, we are now. Right. But there was a time period back then when Jesus had certain things that needed to be done 
And he needed to kind of tone that down a bit. So he tells his disciples, don't tell anybody that I am the Christ. It was not yet time for public proclamation. That came later, but not yet. Now let's look at the next point. A great mistake. Matthew 16, verses 21 and 22. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now we won't read verse 22 yet. I just want you to get this picture in your mind. Jesus says, Whom do ye say that I am? Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven hath revealed it unto you. Peter, your name is Peter now. It's no more Simon. Here's the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever is loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Great promises, but guys, don't tell people this. And then Jesus goes on. Because the time is coming when I'll have to go to Jerusalem. And I'm going to deliver myself over to the hands of the religious leaders there. And they're going to persecute me. And they're going to kill me. And then three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. Now notice what happens in verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. What? As I pointed out earlier, Jesus was planning to take his discipleship program to the next level. It's not that Jesus never taught on his death or his burial or his resurrection. He had taught on that before. He had spoken of it actually a number of times. I think the most obvious is in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, where he speaks of Jonah and the whale. He says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It's pretty clear to me. He's going to die and be buried. Was that an amen or an achu? Who did that? Was that you? Who did that? Anyway, amen or achu. So it's pretty clear to me when I read it that he's talking about dying, being buried, and being raised again. I get it. Apparently they didn't see it quite so well. So Christ has spoken of this on a number of occasions, but now he gets more intense. He says, it says that he began to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That's pretty deep. That's pretty intense. That's a lot of detail. The plan, God's plan, has now been clearly revealed. They need to understand what's going to happen. What is about to transpire that they're going to see and be a very personal part of. They're supposed to understand this now. He says the same thing, by the way, in the next chapter of the Mount of Transfiguration, which we'll get to later. But in Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23, it says, And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. They shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. He, he really ceases from teaching a lot of other things to his disciples at this point, And he's really focusing in on this whole thing about the death and the burial and the resurrection. So much so that he repeats this lesson again and again and again and again and again. Matthew chapter 20. Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the, in, unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. That's the mission. That's the plan. God's plan. That's the purpose. This is what I'm going to be doing, gentlemen. This is God's will. This is the plan. This is the purpose of God. This is what lies ahead for us. This was the point of it all. This was the mission. It was the will of God. It was non-negotiable. He must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer many things. He must be killed. And he must rise the third day. There is no salvation without it. You cannot have salvation without the cross. It can come no other way. There could be no cleansing 
without the shedding of Christ's blood. That was the plan of God. <clears throat> but Peter, well, Peter's one of those guys that he was kind of a free thinker and a big mouth. And he has a problem with this. You see, Peter doesn't want to go to Jerusalem and you know, see Jesus delivered into the hands of the religious leaders and the suffer and the die. That's not what he wants. Oh, he wants to go to Jerusalem, all right. I mean, every Jew wants to go to Jerusalem. But he wants Jesus to go to Jerusalem and be the king. That's what he wants. That's his plan. That's his thinking. He doesn't want a suffering Messiah. He wants a reigning king. But Peter needed to see that Jesus was not only a king, but he was also the suffering Messiah, the Savior. Faith that does not accept Christ, the Christ of Calvary, is not a saving faith. You can believe that he was a great prophet. But that's not good enough. You can believe that he was a rabbi and a great teacher. That's not good enough. You can believe that he was a good man and taught a lot of good things, but that's not good enough. You must accept Christ as Savior, the Christ of Calvary that died and shed his blood for the remission of our sins. That's what you must accept. That's what you must see him as. Without that, you have nothing, nothing, except the eternity ahead in hell. This is where Peter makes his great mistake. He actually presumes, this guy is amazing, he actually presumes to rebuke the Lord, to set Jesus straight, to explain how things really should be. And I know it's kind of strange. It's strange to me. Peter goes from making a great confession, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And not long after, maybe minutes, maybe 30 minutes, I don't know, not long after he goes, no, 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 Lord, you're wrong. <laughs> From great confession to great digression in a matter of minutes. And you see that and you say, wow, <laughs> Peter, I, I guess he sort of missed the part about the resurrection because he was so focused on that whole death and everything that he kind of missed the glory part. So Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. And I, I just can't think of any other word other than incredible arrogance. That's probably two words, isn't it? Incredible arrogance. That's what comes to my mind. He rebukes him. After all Jesus had taught, after all that Jesus had done, no matter how clearly Jesus had proven himself, and even after the Holy Spirit bore witness to Peter of who Jesus is, Peter was still perfectly willing to believe what he wanted to believe rather than to believe the truth. And there's a lot of people like that. A lot. Some have pointed out the zeal that Peter had. They said, well, Peter's not all bad. Look at his great zeal. He's defending the Lord. He did. Remember, he went to the garden. He took a sword. And he was sleeping and he woke up and he cut off Malchus, the high priest's the servant's ear. Right? And Jesus said, whoa, Peter, that's not what we're doing here. He puts the ear back on. Remember that? Peter was no coward. Sometimes he was, though. Right? When he's standing by the fire. You were with them. I know you were with them. You, you had their accent. Not me. I wasn't with them. I don't even know him. Peter was a very complex man. And here he is in this passage of Scripture filled with a great zeal for the Lord. Great zeal. But folks, what good is zeal without knowledge? It's like having a rocket without a guidance system. It's all flash, really exciting, but never really accomplishes anything. I've heard Christians say, I'm not much of a studier. Maybe, maybe this describes you. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I don't want to know. Maybe this describes you. You know, I'm really not much of a studier. I, I don't really study my Bible much, but I've got a great prayer life. I may not pray all the time. Great. You've got a great zeal, but you need a little knowledge. You need both. You, I'm, I'm glad you've got a great prayer life, but you need to match that zeal with knowledge. Because if you don't, you're going to ultimately make the same types of mistakes that Peter made. You might not have realized it, but Peter is a perfect example of what Paul was talking about later. Turn to Romans chapter 10. <coughs> Romans 10, verses 1 through 3.
Paul writes and he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear the record that they have a great zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The world is filled with people who say that they love the Lord. And yet, they won't accept Him as the Scriptures reveal Him to be. They don't want a Savior. They don't want to admit that they're sinners and that Jesus died for their sin. That's really what it's all about. They do not want to admit that they're sinners, but every one of us have to humble ourselves before God and admit that we're sinners before we can be saved. You ever gone to a rich man? And you said to a rich man, you say, you need to be saved. And he says, from what? I got a mansion? A yacht, three or four Maserati sitting in my parking lot. I mean, I got all of this money. I got a comfortable life. What do I need to be saved from? Sir, Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life for Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, wait a minute, young man. I'm not a sinner. You say, how could somebody say that when the Bible very clearly says all have sinned? How could somebody say, I'm not a sinner? I have met people that have said that. What I'm telling you is a reality. I remember one day uh, a woman in the back of the van talking to my wife. My wife brought up the fact that we're all sinners. And this lady says, not me. I knew immediately. She may have professed to be a child of God, but she was not. Because every child of God knows that they're a sinner yet saved by grace. Isn't that wonderful? We have a zeal. A lot of people have a zeal for religion. But a zeal for religion won't save you. If you're here this morning and you've, you've come to church and amen, I'm glad. I, I like to have people to preach to. It makes preaching easier when you've actually got people to preach to. But the fact is, if all you have is religion and there's never been a point in your life when you have confessed your sins to God, confessed your sins and asked Christ to save you, if you've never done that, you've only got zeal, but you don't have true salvation. You're no better off than all those Jews. Yeah, yeah he's John the Baptist, raised from the dead. He's Jeremiah, he's, he's Isaiah. He's a great prophet. But whom say he that I am? Thou art the Christ, the anointed one, the savior of the world. The son of the living God. Have you come to that? Now let's look and see what Jesus says about it. Because you would have thought that something like this would have been committed by Judas Iscariot. You know, I mean, they're all 12 there. You would have thought that it would have been Judas Iscariot going, no, 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 Jesus, not that way. But it wasn't Judas Iscariot. This is Peter. He's the guy that's going to be the leader. You know, the leader Peter. That's who it is. He's the one that opens his big mouth. And what does Jesus do? Notice this great rebuke in verse 23. Great rebuke, verse 23. But he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Wow. First, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, then, not too long thereafter, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter makes a great confession and then a great digression. And Jesus, on the other hand, meets that with a great blessing. And then, get thee behind me, Satan. <clears throat> I don't know about you, but I personally wouldn't want to be called Satan. If you called me Satan, I would be unhappy. But this is not you. This is Jesus. Wow. That would shake me in my boots for sandals in those days. <laughs> On the one hand, when Peter was making his great confession, he was blessed of the Father, but now standing in opposition to the will of God, he is Satan's tool. <clears throat> Did you know you could be Satan's tool? Yeah. You know what the will of God is for something and you're standing in the way of that, you are Satan's tool. Jesus called him an offense. Thou art an offense unto me. Offense is the Greek word scandalon. Interesting word. We get the word scandal from that. But it actually means a stumbling stock, a stumbling block. 
a, a, a stumbling stone, I guess you could say. In other words, Peter's rebuke was an obstacle in the way of God's plan for salvation. Peter sought to rebuke Jesus, but in actuality, it was the devil behind it all. How quickly the enemy sneaks in. You ever have one of those, one of those days where maybe you went to church and, I mean, maybe the, you know, the fellowship was great and the songs were uplifting and the preaching was okay because it was, after all, Pastor Jim, so it was only okay. And you were filled with the Spirit and it felt wonderful and you're on your way home and you get home and it only took just a moment for the devil to sneak in. That's all it took. The next thing you know, you're lying flat on your back looking up going, what in the world happened? The devil is no fool. He's smart. And he knows just when and how to attack. Peter, he seeks to rebuke Jesus, but the devil's behind it. Peter's, here's the thing. Peter's faithlessness and Peter's zeal, though he, he had great zeal, that approach could not be tolerated. It had to be stopped immediately. It had to be nipped in the bud. So right in front of all of the others. Now what happens here? Peter, Peter, come over here for a moment. We need to talk. No, 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 no. Right in front of everybody else. Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. You know, Peter was probably like, wait a minute, Lord, now this and this and this and this and this. As he shrank down and was humbled. Uh, I'm assuming it doesn't say that, but I'm assuming that that's probably what happened. Peter did not, Jesus' words, Peter did not savor or hold proper regard to the things of God. And what were those things of God? And here's the thing. What Jesus was talking about was the appointed sufferings that he was going to go through. And there's a lot of people who want religion, but they want a religion with no suffering. They want a gospel with no blood. They want, they want salvation without struggle. And, and there's plenty of religions to choose from. If that's what they want, they can go out and find something that gives them just that. But if you come to Christ, you come to Christ at Calvary. There is no other way to heaven. The true believer who wants to draw near to Christ, the true believer has a completely different desire. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Now Paul is writing here, he's writing about his own life, looking back. And he says this, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss. For the excellency of of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. Let's pause there for a minute, because verse 8 holds an important truth. He says, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count them but dumb. You know what the Korean word for dung is? Dong. Yeah. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't worry if I lose Dumb. It didn't bother Paul to lose dumb. Do you know why it bothers you when you lose something in life? Because you see value in it that you shouldn't see. What we ought to see in life is like Paul did. I count all things but loss. I count all things but dumb. So that when you lose it, hey, that's better. I mean, I personally don't like a lot of dumb laying around in my life, so if I lose it, that's okay. Right? Notice verse 9. And being found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. Amen. And the power of his resurrection. Amen. We love that stuff. And the fellowship of his sufferings. That's good. And the... Wait a minute. What's this? The fellowship of his sufferings? Hold on a minute. Did I just say amen to that? Hold on a second. Being made conformable to his death? Hold on a minute. 
I didn't sign up for that Christianity. I wanted the other one with the mansions and the cars and, you know, the one where I, I give a little bit and sow my faith seed and, and God blesses me and I get all this gold and riches. That Christianity does not exist. It's not Christianity. That's another Jesus. That's another spirit. That's another gospel. And it will do you no good. What you need is Jesus. But if you have Jesus, you have to count your life as done. It's not all about what you have. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Peter was letting Satan influence him. Satan was tempting Jesus to give up the cross. So Jesus says to him, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan, using Peter, was an offense to him. He was a stumbling block. And at that moment, Peter was not helping Jesus. He was hindering Jesus. I'm going to share this with you. I, this is funny. It's not really funny. It's kind of irritating in a sense. But um, there was a guy here a few years ago. Um, he came to the church maybe three times in his whole time here. And he was here for several years. Then when he left, he wrote me a scathing email telling me everything that was wrong with our church, saying that I was... Reagan-esque. I mean, to me, that wasn't an insult. I kind of like Reagan. <laughs> but, but he thought it was an insult, so I'm trying to understand his point. Uh, I'm old-fashioned, and, you know, I'm still using the old-fashioned everything, and I'm still preaching the old-fashioned way, and I'm still using all the old-fashioned songs, and we're never going to grow until we start getting new-fashioned. And I didn't answer. I just blew it off. I said, forget it. Not worth my time. Well, something went wrong with his new job, so he pops his head in to visit, <clears throat> like three weeks after the email. And uh, I'm upstairs in the office. I know he's here, and I'm, I'm praying. I'm like, Lord, help me have a, the right attitude and the whole thing. And he comes up to the office while I'm, you know, doing something. And he, he, he comes in, and he says, Pastor, uh, I hope my words didn't really offend you. And I stopped, and I said, um, your words do not affect me. Uh, however... How dare you? What makes you think that you can go into any church that you're not even a member of and tell the pastor how he needs to do his business? This is the kind of guy he is. So now we're buying a building. We're buying a building, and by God's grace, in the last week and a half or so, we have been promised or have already raised almost $100,000. Yeah, that's God. Now, if you doubted my leadership for one moment up to this time, that ought to settle it for you now. All right? I never expected that. Within hours after sending out the first email saying, we have a project, would you consider helping? Somebody wrote me and said, I'll give you $30,000, but it's going to have to wait a week. Okay, I can wait a week for $30,000, no problem. Right? That's God. It's not me. I'm not a great talker. I just explain the need and God moves in the hearts. And, and put the, But I get an email from this guy. Yeah. And it's not God's will and I'm out of God's will and I ought not be doing it. I need to go down to some old part of the city and, and reach out to the, you know, to the old part of the city or whatever. And he's trying to explain all of this stuff to me that I'm out of God's will because after all, the Air Force is filled with a bunch of transgender people now and they're not going to like the way I preach and the base is going to beat me up and all of this stuff. And I'm just like... Delete. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. There are just people in the world that will not get behind the will of God. They just won't. I want to be like Nehemiah. Either help or get out of the way because we're building a wall. That's what Nehemiah said. Peter was not helping. We've got to learn to savor everything that comes from the hand of God. Can I ask you, what is it that you desire? Are you willing to accept whatever the Lord sends into your life? Are you ready to savor God's appointed everything, the good things and the sufferings? Are you ready to be content with whatever state the Lord has chosen for you? It's never easy. But we need to learn contentment. That's what Paul said. I have learned to be content. 
this is what Jesus was clearly referring to because this is what he follows up with. And this will be the end of the message. Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Are you a disciple? This is for you. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As the pianist comes to play. How much are you like Peter? You go from a great confession of faith to really blowing it. If we were to be honest, that could be every one of us in this room. We've all been guilty of doing that, I'm sure. You might be right now living in a, a point of struggle in your life and you're struggling with the will of God. You're not happy with what's going on. Now is the time to surrender that, to look at your life and to see everything, the good things, the bad things, all of that, and count it but dumb that you may win Christ. As the piano begins to play, if God has spoken to your heart, would you come pray about it? The altar is open. we got places up here for prayer. Won't you come as the piano plays? How has the Lord spoken to you?